And we started talking about fear a few weeks ago. We've talked about the sources of fear, what causes us fear, why we don't want to feel fear. And so we're going to finish that whole series today. Today we've been talking about, we've been talking about the monster that lives under the bed. Um, today we're going to find out who the monster is. We're going to pull him out from underneath the bed and we're going to kill him. Doesn't that sound like a great service? All right, so we're just going to kill that monster today, and uh, so we're going to finish the service. If, you, uh, if you're watching at home or watching online, we're glad that you're part of this. If you're not aware, we do uh, record the service. The second service is recorded. We broadcast on the local NBC affiliate, and uh, people in Plentywood, Montana, Crosby, North Dakota, Watford City, Sydney, Stanley, Powers Lake, uh, all those little towns are tuning in and watching, and they're watching you. So anyway, uh, we're glad that you're here and a part of the whole thing. We, we kind of like fear. Let's just be honest. We like fear when we're in control. We like fear when we're in control. Any roller coaster fans here? Raise your hands. We love roller coasters. Isn't it just great? Robin and I went on a roller coaster last August, and it was just great as you stand in line and you hear the screaming, just the screaming as the roller coaster goes around. Before we got on this one, we had to empty our pockets and put everything in a locker, including cell phones. It was fascinating to watch people standing in line waiting to get on a roller coaster and they didn't have a cell phone in their hand. They had to talk to people. It was just amazing to see that whole thing. So we, we like fear when we're in control of it. When, when we're not in control, we don't, we don't like fearful moments. Like if you're a parent, you know this whole thing. You're, you're teaching your child to ride the bike and you get the child on the bike and you're running alongside, you're running alongside and you let go of the seat and it's like you know, crash, and you just know it's going to happen. And you let go of your child. What can you do? I mean, you can't run alongside the bike forever. And uh, so you, you trust your, your child. You, there's a lot of things you trust with children. And we say things amazingly in prayer like, oh, God, I trust my children to you. Like we have a lot of choice, right? Our, our children are just on loan to us from God. Um, but we, we, we're supposed to trust the things that we hold near and dear in our hearts to God. Um, we, we, we know it's in our hearts. You know it's in your heart. Yeah, I know it's in your heart. It's where you spend time and energy. And we're supposed to trust these things, people, relationship, income, finances, job, career, status, titles, all these things are supposed to be trusted to God. But let, let's just be honest for a little bit. How am I supposed to trust the things in my life that I can see and feel and smell and hear to a God I can't see. How am I supposed to trust him? Because let's be honest, Pastor, there's a lot of things that give me fear in life. A lot of things that give me fear in life. For some of you, the greatest fear that you're dealing with today, the greatest fear you're dealing with today is the fear of being alone. You're alone right now. And the fear that you have is not that you're going to be alone because you're already alone. The fear that you have is that you're always going to be alone. For some of you, it's abandonment and rejection. You've already been abandoned and rejected, and the fear is that you'll always live feeling abandoned and rejected. For some of you, it's the, the fear of losing safety, the things that make you feel safe. It could be the roof over your head. It could be the relationship that you're in. It's the security that you feel in your heart, and you fear losing that. For some of you, you fear losing your health. That's a concern of yours. If you're in your 20s, if you're in your teens, you don't care about it. I mean, you can eat as many cheeseburgers and Twinkies as you want, but then something happens magically on your 40th birthday. Just, it just happens on that day, right? So that's what you have to look forward to. So you're, you're afraid of losing your health. Some of you are afraid of, if you're a mom, you're afraid of losing your mind. Okay, I'm just, just some. For some of you, for some of you, it's the fear of losing a relationship. The marriage is unstable. There's an insecurity in the marriage. You're dating somebody right now, and there's this constant fear that somebody else is going to come along and steal that person away. So there's a sense of fear of losing that. For some of you, for some of you, let's just be honest. Right now, the reality is that's the fear of losing your job. And along with losing the job means I lose money. If I lose money, I lose what I hold in my heart to be secure and safe. You're afraid of losing that fear of losing all of it. And you live a life of fear. And do you, do you know why we live a life of fear? Because what if, what if, what if, what if it happens and God doesn't? What if I do lose my job? 
and God doesn't supply? What if they do walk out of the relationship and I never find anybody else? What if I never find anybody to fall in love with? What if no, nobody ever loves me? What if? What if? Because what if that happens and God doesn't? Pastor, it's all nice, neat, tidy package when you're up there talking about it on Sunday morning, but l- l- let, me, let me tell you about my life and what I feel and what I'm facing, what I'm going through. This is real. But on the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, what, what, what if you just knew? What if you knew something else? What if you just knew... What if you just knew that there was a God that really did love you so much unconditionally that when you reached out to him, he would reach out to you? What if you really knew in your heart of hearts that he was there and you could trust him and there was nothing, there was no wall, no obstacle, no barrier between you and him and you just knew there was this sense of security that if you stood and you just fell backwards, his hand would be right there to hold you and catch you? What if you just had that sense of knowing inside of your heart? What if you just knew that? Let me just tell you something. Here, here's what I want you to really know and understand. Fear and love cannot coexist. Fear and love do not coexist. Fear and love do not and cannot coexist. When love begins to grow, fear begins to decrease. As love begins to increase, fear begins to decrease. Now, let, let me share you th- with you what, what I mean. I'm going to read out of two books the same author. If you brought a Bible or a device with you, I want you to find 1 John. 1 John, it's a short book way towards the end of your Bible. It's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and then Revelation, but you'll find it way towards the end. I'm just going to land on a few verses here to give you a, kind of a, a starting point, talking about love and trust and relationship with God. And then, and then the same author... John wrote one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we're going to jump there. So in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 9, listen to what John says. John says, God showed, God showed. He didn't talk about it. It wasn't theory. The love of God was a demonstration. He loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. We believe that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was a historical event. We believe it happened. If you're here today, it's probably because you believe in that event. It's a historical event, and it became a demonstration and proof that God loved us. Now, now, here's why this is a big deal. Look at verse number 10. This is real love. And then John writes it this way. Not that we loved God, Because let's just be honest, we don't. Our natural desire inside of us is not to love God, it's to love ourself. I love being selfish. Don't you? Come on, I love being selfish. Because when you're selfish, it's all about me. Let's just be honest. Church on Sunday morning, it's all about me, right? Let's set the temperature because it's all about me. Let's have the right kind of songs because it's all about me. Right, let's just, it's always about me. That's inside of you and it's inside of me. So to love God is not natural, but he says this is real love. Not not, not, not that we loved God, but but he, he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Again, in two weeks, we're gonna celebrate that fact. Verse 16 says, God is love. And all who, uh, who live in love, they live in God. And God lives in them. In other words, there is this this connectedness that God and love coexist, that where there is God, there's love, and where there is God and where there is love, there's no fear anymore. He says it like this in verse 18, such love, that kind of love, has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not experienced his perfect love. Let me put it to to you this, this way. Isn't it true, isn't it true, that when tragedy happens in your life? Isn't it true when difficulties and challenges happen? Isn't it true when you lose the job, when you get the diagnosis, when they broke up with you? Isn't it true that when something bad happens, you wonder sometimes, you've wondered at least once, if God is mad at you? You've wondered if this is punishment from God. And the reason that we wonder that is because we really don't know the character. We don't understand the heart, the nature, and the personality of the God that we claim to serve. What I want to show you from a story today is that maybe your perceptions about God have been misguided. 
And I want to show you, there's a demonstration and a story about perfect love that will explain to you and explain to me that, you know what, God is always there even when we fail him, even when we disappoint him, that the bad things in our life aren't necessarily his punishment and disapproval in our lives. In your Bibles again, I want you to, to find the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go way to the end of that book, John chapter 21. Let, let me give you a little backdrop to this story. John chapter 21. John, John is one of the disciples. He's one of the 12 that follows Jesus wherever Jesus goes. Jesus on the night when he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, one of those disciples, his name was Peter. Peter had told Jesus just a, a couple of days before, he said, Jesus, no matter where you go, I'll go with you. I would put my life on the line for you. I'll do anything for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, really, Peter, really? Guess what, guess what? Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, three separate times, you're going to deny that you even know me. No, I would never do that. I love you. Jesus is arrested. Jesus is arrested. While he's on kangaroo court up in somebody's room and they're, they're mocking him and they're ridiculing him and beginning the beating, Peter's standing outside wondering what is going on with Jesus and he's standing next to a charcoal fire, warming his hands because it's the cold of the evening. There's a little girl standing there at the same fire, probably a junior high girl, and she Here's Peter speaking. She kind of looks at his profile in the firelight. She, she says, you were, you, you were with him, weren't you? The guy up there, that you were with Jesus. No, 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 no. No, you got the wrong guy. Second time, you're, hey, you're one, of, you're one of those followers of Jesus. No, 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 no. In fact, Jesus was getting arrested and Peter's standing around his fire and the third time he starts to curse. No, absolutely not expletive maybe I don't know what was in there and as soon as he said that the third time the rooster crowed and when Peter heard the rooster crow we're told that he went away and wept bitterly I don't know how bad you feel like you've let God down and if you deserve his wrath and punishment and here's Peter Jesus um hung on a cross the next day, dies hours later. And, and, and Peter never has the opportunity to go to Jesus and say, I am sorry. Will you forgive me? I am so sorry. All of us in this room know that we have offended somebody. Somebody has left the room, they've hung up the phone, they've walked away from the conversation, and, and it was everything that we could do to, to, to just kind of get our composure, and we know that we hurt their heart, and we wanted immediately to make things right and tell them that we were sorry, but they left the room, they hung up the phone, and we wanted to hear them say, I forgive you. We, 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 we weren't going to rest until we heard, I forgive you. We all love and long to hear those words, I forgive you. So Jesus is buried in the grave. Three days later, he rises again from the dead. He appears to some of the disciples and uh, has interaction with them. And then, and then John picks up this amazing story in John chapter 21. John chapter 21. It says in verse number one, Jesus appeared again to his disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And then I love how John says this, this is how it happened. You've, you've all told a story, and then either your spouse or your sibling said, no, let me tell you how the story really happened. So here John's writing the letter. He says, let me tell you how it really happened. And this is how it happened. Verse number two. Several of the, uh, the, the, the disciples were there along the Sea of Galilee. Can you smell it? Can you smell the water? Can you smell that, that water? Can you... Uh, smell all the fragrances that go along with standing next to a body of water and you can hear the gentle lapping of the waves against the shore. The disciples for three and a half years had followed Jesus around and saw miracles and amazing things and really had purpose and this is why we're getting up in the morning. What are we going to do today, Jesus? And now Jesus, Jesus is gone. They're standing next to the Sea of Galilee and um, I imagine them there, maybe skipping rocks across the water. Maybe somebody's whittling a piece of driftwood. 
And Simon Peter was there, Thomas, uh, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, John the guy writing the story, and then two other disciples. Didn't know what to do. Verse 3 says, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. <laughs> oh, we're going to come along too. You know, if there's any fishermen here, you just fish when you're bored, right? That's the only reason you fish. If you're fishing, you're, you're, you're bored. And you're probably boring. <laughs> How many enemies did I just make? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Well, they went out in the boat. They went out in the boat, but they caught nothing. They caught nothing all night. I guess, I guess the fishermen would fish at night because that's when fish would be near the surface of the water, schooling together. And all night long, they cast their nets out into the water, and they would pull them back in. They'd start to pull the nets back in, and every time they pulled the net back in, there was nothing in it. All night long, they did this. We don't know how many times they cast the net out, but they caught nothing in it. At dawn, it says in verse 4, the light is still gray. You could barely make out anybody's faces. It's so dark. But you know that sun is coming. Jesus was standing on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. I, I, I imagine I'm in this boat with them. In fact, we're going to read in a few moments, they're, they're only about 100 yards offshore. And, uh, they can see a, a light spot along the banks. Obviously, it's the garments of somebody standing there. And they can see that somebody's there, but they're not sure who it is. Verse number 5 says, uh, he called out to him, uh, Fellows, have you caught any fish? Imagine all seven of them in unison. No. And then, I love the humor in the story. Verse number 6. Then he said, Throw your net out on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll catch some. Which I can about imagine one of the disciples, James, Duh, I told you guys, you've been throwing it out on the right side of the boat. It's supposed to be on the left side of the boat. Then we'll catch some fish. Duh, you know. I don't know why Jesus told them to do this. It might refer back to another interaction he had with the disciples a, a couple of years earlier. Why they did it, I don't know. Maybe they thought, oh, we've got nothing to lose. And they did, and they did. And uh, they couldn't haul in the net because there was so many fish in it. <laughs> Verse 7 says, Then the disciple uh, who uh, Jesus loved said to Peter, I, I love this, he's probably sitting really close to Peter, he said, It's the Lord. And then look, look Simon Peter must have believed him when he said, it's the Lord. Because look what Simon did. Simon Peter, he heard that it was the Lord, and he put on his tunic, for he had stripped it for work. He jumped into the water, and he headed to shore. I think Peter needed to get back there. If that was Jesus, he needed to get there. He needed to hear that Jesus still loved him. He needed to know that there was still relationship with Jesus. Even though I've denied him, I didn't get the chance or the opportunity to tell him how sorry I am for this. i got to get back there and talk to him. I want some alone time with Jesus to connect with him and know that I'm still okay with my Lord and Savior. And so he jumps over the side of the boat and he starts to swim and he gets back there before the rest of them. Verse 8 says, The others stayed with the boat. They pulled the loaded net back to shore for they were only about 100 yards from there. Verse 9, and when they got there, they found a breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. <laughs> Jesus has such subtle ways of communicating, doesn't he? Um, Peter warming himself the night he betrayed Jesus over a charcoal fire. And when he gets back to shore, there's Jesus waiting for him. Not just with a charcoal fire, but with a meal as well. Verse 10, uh, Jesus said, bring, bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus said. And so Simon went aboard and he dragged the net to shore. There was 153 large fish and yet the net wasn't torn. I'm thinking, Peter must have been a beast. I mean, 153 fish in this net. 
could have been 300 pounds, and he grabs this thing and just heaves it back to the shore. The story goes on in verse 12. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the dis- and he, This is what I love about Jesus. He cares about the most basic needs in all of our lives, including a meal. And then, uh, I think it was an awkward moment. Jesus hadn't said, hey guys, just so you know, yes, it is me. Jesus was not wearing a name tag. There was no badge, okay? It says that none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. (laughs) I love it. And then the story shifts a little bit. And John begins to write about just one of the figures, one of the seven men. He just kind of zeroes down on one of the seven, and it just happens to be Peter in verse number 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, here's what he said, Simon, Simon. He calls him Simon. Jesus is the one that gave Simon the name Peter. Peter, your name's going to be Cephas Rock. And on this church, I'm going to build my church on this rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It was the name, he gave him the name Cephas, the name Peter. But, but he doesn't refer to him as Peter, as rock, the unchangeable, the unshakable guy here. He says, Simon, Simon. I think it was intimate. Simon, he says, Simon, son of John, do you, do you love me? You've heard the sermon preached before, and we just have one word. We, we love pizza, we love dogs and cats, and we love our spouse. And we know the difference because we know the context. And in the original language, it's a different kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Here he says, do, do, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord. You, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, well, then, then feed my lambs. What Jesus is asking Peter is is this, Peter, 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 he says, look, do you have this depth of love and commitment for me? I mean, is your love deep? Is your heart saturated with love for me? I mean, are you truly 100% sold out and committed to me? And Peter is saying, in this, he's saying, Lord, you know that I like you. You know that I have affection for you. And then Jesus says, well, go feed my lambs. And I love the fact that he says, feed my lambs in here. You know, you know what Jesus is saying? You know what's been near and dear to the heart of Jesus? You and me. And even though, Peter, you denied me three times, I haven't given up on you. I'm still willing to commit to you the most important task in my heart because I trust you and I love you and I believe in you. You might have denied me, but I haven't denied you. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question. He said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, do you have this depth, this depth of love for me? Peter says, Lord, you you know that I, I have affection for you. You know I care about you. Jesus is asking Peter, do do you have this full surrender for me? And Peter's kind of holding back a little bit and saying, Jesus, you know that I have reverence and respect for you. You know that I I care about you. And again, Jesus says, uh, he says, take care of my sheep. And And then verse 17 says, a third time he asked him. And now Jesus changes it up a little bit. Because now Jesus, when he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He's now using the same word that Simon's been using. He's saying, Simon, do you really have affection for me? I mean, really? Do you really like me? (laughs) Must have been uncomfortable for Peter because he's taken to task. Goes on to say that Peter was hurt. He was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, and I love this, you know everything. (laughs) If Jesus ever asks you a question, I think the best way to respond is just say, Lord, you know, all right? I'm not going to assume to know everything. You know everything. And that's what Peter says, you know everything. You know that I love you. I think what Peter was saying is, you know what, Jesus? I let you down. I let you down the other night. And when you ask if I really love you, I'd like to say yes, but I don't know myself the way you know me. So I don't know if I can answer the question honestly or not. You alone know my heart. I failed you once. It might happen again. Nobody knows me like you do. 
But Jesus said, go, go take care of my sheep. You know what happened to Peter along the banks of, of the Galilee that morning? He experienced perfect love. I, I, think, I think Jesus was trying to instill in Peter, yep, I think anybody who did what you did would, would, feel, would feel what you feel. But let me just give you some reassurance. I still love you, Peter. And you know what the monster under the bed is? The monster under the bed, the thing that causes fear and angst in our life, the monster under the bed, and it can be the same for all of us in any given circumstance, is insecurity. There's an insecurity. We're not sure if we're loved by God. We're not sure if we're loved by our spouse. We're not sure if we're loved by our parents. We're not sure if we're loved in the relationship. We're not sure if God's going to take care of us if we lose our job. We're just not sure if we're always going to be alone. If we're alone right now, we're just not sure. There's an insecurity. There's an uncertainness about what God's going to do on his part. It's an insecurity. That's the monster that we need to kill. And that being said, perfect love is, is what Peter experienced. And so then I say this to you, that fear and love don't coexist. Fear and love don't coexist. When you know where you stand with God, when you know that if you stand there and you fall backwards and God is going to catch you, there's no fear. When you're a child, you know that, don't you? I can remember standing alongside of the edge of the swimming pool at Harmon Park right down here in Williston. And my mother's standing in the water, and I'm maybe two and three years old, and I just knew that if I jumped, her hands were going to catch me. I just knew it. I did not question it. There was no insecurity in that. I mean, no parent would stand in the water and say, jump, 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 and then as soon as they jump, oh, just kidding. And if you as a parent don't do that, why would God do that. The closer, the closer you bring Jesus into your life, the less fear you will feel and experience. I, I, imagine for just a moment what, what, what it would feel like if you brought Jesus into the places where you feel and experience the most fear right now. Let's, let's just be honest. Let's talk for a moment. Some of you are alone right now. You're single. You're divorced. You're widowed. You're a widower. And there's the fear of being alone. Here's what my Bible says. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and finds favor from the Lord. Why would God put that in his word if it wasn't true? <laughs> Ladies, you're sitting here going, oh, that's great, that, that's for a guy. But just think about it on the other side of that thing. If a guy finds you, you're a good thing. Does God care about that? Yeah, God cares about that. What about, what about the fears of rejection? Uh, do, you know why, do you know why you're so afraid of rejection? Because you put your value on people's opinion of you instead of God's opinion of you. And so your self-worth comes out of the mouth of the people that surround you instead of from the truth of the Word of God. What about the fear of losing your children? Some parents are almost just petrified the moment their child walks out the door. From the moment they start to have some independence and they're going to go ride their bicycle around and you're so afraid of them and put your helmet on and put your pads on and get on your bike and make sure you get off your bike when you get to the corner and cross and only go with the crosswalks. We just go, we just go ballistic with our children's safety and as they grow up and get older, we just, we're just afraid of letting them drive the car and the first time they're going to get a, a heart ache and a heart crush when they get broke up in a relationship and we do everything we can. We're just absolutely paralyzed and we're possessed with protecting our children because nobody can take care of our children like we can. And we forget that our children are on loan from God. We're just a steward. I kind of like the relationship that you're in. You're, you're a steward of your spouse's heart. You don't own them or possess them. You're simply a caretaker over their affections. What if we started to commit more of these things to the Lord? What if we're afraid because, um, what if we're afraid because the thing that we fear losing the most. The reason that we fear losing it the most is because we place so much security in it. Listen, if you're in a relationship right now and your security comes from your spouse, what happens when your spouse is no longer there? If, if, if your security comes from your money and your paycheck and your job, 
what do you do? And that's no longer there. If your security comes from people's words and their affirmation and their accolades and all these things about you, what, what, what do you do when, when, when that's gone? Because you know what? Relationships change. Uh, jobs change. And people change. And health changes. And possessions change. But God has never, ever changed. Why wouldn't we trust God with more of the things that cause us fear in life? Maybe today there's a fear inside of your heart. You, fe you fear this. You fear that you have let God down so badly that between you, every time you go to pray, every time you go to pray, every time you go to pray, every time you pray, every time there's a crisis, every time there's a need, and you need something from God, in the back of your mind there's this wall, this little obstacle, this little thing, this big thing, this relationship, this betrayal, this denial, this big mistake you made in your life. You, I mean, you go through the litany of all the stuff you've done in your life, and you think before I can get to God, I've got to get through all this garbage. Well, why do you think you send Jesus into the world? It was to remove all that and say, come on in, come on, I love you. He demonstrated his love by sending Jesus to us. I don't think you've done anything so bad that God won't accept you back. See, fear, fear fades when love grows. Fear fades when love grows, and love grows out of relationship, and out of relationship comes trust. <laughs> What, what, if, what, if, what if you just knew? 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 What if you just knew that there was a God that was there to catch you when you fell? I, I would be willing to, to say this to you that your level of fear in any given circumstance is in proportion to your depth of love and trust in relationship to God. Your level of fear is in proportion to your level of love and trust in relationship with God. And so, um, <laughs> week by week I stand up here with you and um, I appeal to you at the end, if you're new here and you've never been here before, you're, you're gonna hear the spiel before you go. I tell you to read the Bible. Do you know why I tell you to read the Bible? Because the Bible has truth in it, it is truth. And when you start reading about God's opinion of you and about God's care for your children and your relationship and your finances and your well-being, you start to realize, you know, what, what, what do I have to be afraid of? In fact, one of the guys in the Bible wrote it this way, what can mere man do to me? <laughs> maybe, maybe, you remember, maybe you remember being bullied as a kid. I'm just kind of curious this morning, how many of you were bullies as a kid? Raise your hand. We're going to have a special healing service for you at the end today. Just, just saying, all right? But maybe you were bullied as a kid. You were bullied. And, and, and there was those moments, come on, you can remember that when you were intimidated by somebody, there was a level of insecurity walking into that environment. But the moment a parent or an older sibling or a bigger best friend came along with you, you were no longer afraid, were you? What if you brought God into all those situations and just reminded yourself, Dad's with me. Got Dad right here. I don't have to be afraid. You can't do anything to me. My Dad's right here.